Hey folks, Michelle Perlman here, gastroenterologist and physician nutrition specialist. And I'm Amy Perlman, urologist, men's health and sexual medicine specialist. Welcome to Perlman MD's podcast. We are going to tackle all topics related to nutrition, sexual health, exercise, and mindfulness. Stay tuned. Are we ready to rock and roll? Pro it's and rumble. <laughs> Today on Perlman MD's podcast, we are here today with my dear friend and colleague, TV broadcasting legend, Tony Segreto. Tony was drafted right out of high school to the major leagues, spent 40 years older than we are on NBC <laughs> covering sports exclusively. You had to bring that up older than you are? I do. I do. Because we're really? talking on how to age gracefully today, Tony. He covered numerous Super Bowls, the Olympics, the World Series, NBA Finals, the Stanley Cup, horse racing, the U.S. Open, you name it, he's done it. Um, he's interviewed two sitting presidents and carried the Olympic torch in 1996 on the way to Atlanta. I'm honestly not sure how I convinced Tony to join our podcast today, but I am beyond excited and thrilled to finally put Tony in the hot seat. Tony, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I'm honored. I'm honored. Anything for you and anything for Amy. I, uh, this, is, about, this is recorded, Tony. So I'm going to remember that. you. Said that's that. fine. <laughs> Anytime you need me. I, I, uh, I, you know, especially what we're about to talk about, I I'm all into that, you know, as is I'm trying to age as gracefully as I can. I, uh, in April, I will be 72 years old. And, and I, I think 72 years young, 72 years young. In fact, <laughs> On, on the subject we're talking about, and then I'll let you guys take over, you know, there was about two or three years ago where I, I noticed a lot of my former teammates and or classmates, uh, we, out, we all went out, a bunch of former teammates all went out for a drink. And uh, about 20 minutes in, I go, I'm out, I'm done. And they go, where are you going? I said, listen, who has a bad eye? Who has a bad hip? Who has a bad back? Who has a bad shoulder? I said, I'm tired of hearing this. We're 70 years old, guys. We're standing up. We're blinking. We're smiling. We have families. We, we've had a successful you know, careers. Why are we bitching? We got to look at what we have and how, how good we feel. And as a result of that, and some other friends that I have um, that you know have to be three o'clock, it's Ellen's on. I got to watch it. I love Ellen, but I'm not going to, you know, we're at a day where you don't have to schedule watching Ellen at three. Um, I started this baby boomer podcast trying to inspire people to, especially my age, that they still have a lot of value left and they still have a lot of wisdom that they can impart. And it's up to them to find where to put it, right? They can't wait for people to knock on their door and go, you know, hey, you know, come, come save me, come, come give me some sage wisdom. You have to be willing to, at the very least, volunteer and help young people out and try to impart something that you've learned over the, you know, seven decades that you've lived. I love that. <laughs> I mean, you know, most of the people I actually hang out with, when I look at how I spend my weekends, it's funny because I actually rarely spend time, my, I rarely spend my free time with people my own age and actually mm -hmm. rarely in a decade older than me. Yeah. Most of my friends that I hang out with are people in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. I partied with a woman in her 80s on Halloween and it was Love phenomenal it. because yeah. I want to be the dumbest person in the room. Yeah. I want to learn from all these people and figure out how I can live my best life and they've lived it. Yeah. And it's just amazing to be a part of that. Totally agree. And I, and I, use the flip side of that. Uh, I don't, I want to stay engaged with young people so I can stay on top of what's, what's the latest tech, what's the latest gadget, what's the latest social media. I mean, my two children, I have a son who's 27 and a daughter who's 23. They're the brightest young people I know. And I, and I not only enjoy their company, I, I yearn for it when they're not around because they keep me honest. They, they correct me you know, or, and help me with tech and they, they keep me current. And I think that's what's important. Listen, I, I still love music from the 50s when I was growing up in the 60s. I still like watching the old Andy Griffith shows and the Lone Rangers at night. I, I enjoy that. But I also enjoy, you know, some of the, all of the new things that are out too, something that's going to attract me or interest me. So you need to be able to balance that and just not stay in that old world and say, this is the only way it's done. 
right? You still have to be able to do things online. You're still, you know, we, we live in a society where it's instant gratification. Put something in the microwave, it's ready in 10 seconds. You order it from Amazon and chances are, depending on where you live, you could get it the same day. And if it doesn't come the same day, you get annoyed. You know, I'm just oh, yeah. saying, hey, Google, find me a date. I'm that close. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Hey, I, you know, you're not annoyed. You're just damn pissed. Is what you are. <laughs> so Tony, I want to go back to this initiative that you're working on to encourage people of your generation to find their value. What is the response from other people? Are they overwhelmed or do they say, yeah, that sounds awesome? Do they not believe you? I think more often than not, uh, I'll give you an example. A, a former uh, executive producer of mine, brilliant guy, brilliant. Uh, we were out to lunch and he was just saying how bored he was and he didn't, you know, he just wanted to do something. And I said to him, well, I'm starting this baby boomer report. You know, I'd love for you to do some research, vet out people we can interview, you know, we can, we can do it together. And his response was, eh, I don't know. And, and, and they complain about, most of the time they complain about not being able to do anything. And yet when you offer opportunities for them to do something, they're just not, they're not ready. They're not into it. They, they sort of have, have logged into a routine, that comfort zone that they just don't want to break out of. Tony, I want to hear about your experience as an athlete. And we, you and I have talked a lot about nutrition and what, you, what we think is healthy and not healthy. When you were playing ball, did people even talk about nutrition? Like, did anyone ever even realize no, the nutrition not, played a role in performance? No, not really. Not, not really. And I heard your first, your first podcast with the football player mm -hmm. and, and I thought he was brilliant. Uh, I mean, I don't think, you know, it's all about calories in football there, you know, make sure you make sure you're, 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 you're getting your calories and doing it. And, and in baseball, the clubhouse always has like amazing, amazing buffets. I mean, just amazing. And the food's out all day. Like if you want to go eat in between innings, a lot of players will go grab a snack between innings. And, uh, and I think that we're finding out more and more that the nutritionists um, for these teams, and there's, uh, and there's no disrespect for these nutritionists, but they're, they're handcuffed because they can offer the training table, you know, okay, we're going to go through and we're going to, see, eat all the healthy food, right? We're, we're going to be able to do that. But once we let these guys or women loose, what are we going to do? My daughter, one of her, one of her responsibilities at Florida State when she was with the softball pro program after she retired was, um, besides all the other you know, digital stuff she was doing for them, um, when they were away, she would have to order food for them. And there were, there were times when the game would run late and the only place where they could get food was like a Quiznos or, or and again, nothing against any of these places, but they're just basically now getting something to put in their stomach since they've been playing like all day, right? And, and, that's, and that's the issue. It has to be, they have to be trained and they have to have a reason why. You can't just say, we need to have good nutrition. We need to have good nutrition because of this. Because if you fuel your body with really good food, your performance is going to exponentially get better because you're fueled properly. It's like a few, you know, before you were able to put regular gas in most cars, like the higher end cars, the BMWs and the Lexuses and the Mercedes, you got to put high test in, right? What happens if you put regular in? Many times the, the engine would start knocking and, and you would have to bring it in to get service. Same way with our body. So Tony, let's talk a little bit about you as a former athlete now and how nutrition has played a role throughout your lifetime. So, um, I mean, now you still keep active. So what is the role of nutrition in your current life and in, in your ability to continue to live out your mission to live your best life? Now, now, mind you, when I was when I was small, being of an Italian family and, and, and a real matriar uh, a matriarch for a mother, um, there was no nutrition. I mean, the nutrition was great. I mean, the food was amazing, but there was a lot of it all the time. You know, I just got a text from someone that said, some of the traits of an Italian mother, did you eat? You haven't eaten enough, eat some more. You know, <laughs> some of those things. Um, I think I learned that, that um, you know, I believe in eating good food. And, and, and sometimes I, sometimes I get obsessive about it. And, and you have to be careful about that. And I'm, I am now well aware of it. Michelle and I have had conversations, you know, I'm learning more about intuitive eating and how important that is. And, 
and how, you know, when you're on TV, um, you, you, you get caught up in, and I don't mean caught up in a negative way, but you need to always look, look as good as you can possibly look, especially as you get older. You know, that's why at the age of 59, I retired when I did, because it's very similar to what an athlete does, right? Athletes are, are judged by how they perform, what their skill set is, do they can continue to be productive, right? When you're on the air, it's the same thing. Are you getting older? Are you looking older? Are, is your skill set still at the top of its game? And are you still productive? And are people still tuning in? So the last thing you want is to be pushed out the door or an athlete to be farmed out. So you have to make a call. So in, in order to maintain any level of, of consistency and successfulness, you need to be able to take care of yourself, right? For example, you know, never drink during the week. And, and if you want to have a, if you want to have a cocktail, there are times when you have probably more than one that you should have, but, but not, not on a regular basis, right? Um, you, you need to be mindful that you should eat good food. So, because like, for example, when I was doing local, the biggest part of your day was at 11 PM at night. And you'd been working since noon or one o'clock in the afternoon. So how do you fuel your body in such a way that at 11 o'clock at night, regardless of whether you're sitting, your mind still has to be sharp in case, God forbid, something happens big and you don't have, you know, they're feeding you information through your ear. You need to be that sharp. If your blood sugar is too low, if you haven't eaten properly, you're not feeling well. And if you're not feeling well, you're not going to perform well. And if you're not going to perform well, people are going to notice. Mm -hmm. And that's the first, you know, that there's your first part of, of getting that Achilles heel that you don't want to have. So, but in the TV world, are you kind of, um, is it, you have to advocate for yourself and you have to make it happen or is it easy to have like healthy meals nearby? No, there's vending machines that have all the same stuff that every other vending machine has. So you need to be able to figure out, uh, I mean, and listen, for a while there, and this wasn't the brightest thing in the world to do either, but there wasn't anything around where we were where I could get healthy food. So sometimes I would go the entire night and not eat and go home and eat. And mm -hmm. eating at midnight is not the smartest thing either. But at least it was, I felt I was eating healthier. You know? yeah. But I think I've learned, especially now that I get older, um, you, need to stay, you need to keep moving. Mm -hmm. That's my big thing. You need to just move. I don't care how you move, but you got to move. I mean, I walk every day. I just got back to the gym with the pandemic I told you about. Mm -hmm. um, and I do what I can do. I'm, I'm not 31. I don't pick up 250 pounds. Not that I could ever do that. But I mean, it, you do what you can do. And, you know, I'm not going to be, you know, on the fireman's calendar. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just not. Maybe next year, maybe not this year, but next well, year. I don't know. But, but the point <laughs> is, you just need to be able to adapt to who you are. Yeah. Understand that, especially as you get older, it's, it's paramount that you don't sit around. You need, you need to move. You need to set some sort of standard. I mean, whether it's 10,000 steps or 3,000 steps, whatever the amount is, it's got to be something more than, you know, getting up, reading a paper, sitting down, and then sitting down all day and having lunch and watching, you know, search for tomorrow or whatever soap opera you want to watch. I mean, you've got to be able to, you have to have a little bit of a purpose. Yeah. Yeah. I know with some of my own patients, they always tell me, well, doc, when I retire, I will have more time and then I'll take care of myself. And then you hear these stories where people retire and they die of a massive heart attack two yeah. weeks later, you know, yeah. or they retire. And now, you know, they say, I don't have time now, but when I retire, I'll have more time. And now they have all this time and now they have no clue what to do with it. And I saw that with COVID, you yeah. know, time was a very easy excuse. And with COVID mm -hmm. and people were working from home and they actually had more time. I think some of them actually realized that time was never the limiting factor. It's, you know, no one's going to just hand yeah. you the motivation. No. You got to do it. Yeah. Most of my friends who are athletes are actually healthier now than when they were playing. I mean, most of them, there are some that have, you know, gained weight and, and, and really not taking care of themselves, but a majority of them, especially the bigger guys, um, you don't even recognize them half the time because they've just, they've just said, okay, I am done doing this. I don't need to do this anymore. And, and the, the toughest transition for them, for those athletes who have played at a really high level is that when they retire, at 32 or 33 years old, think about that for just a minute. 32 or 33, they are retiring from, an, from a major career. 
most of the world at 32 or 33, you are just starting your career. I mean, that's an, think about when you think of it, you're just starting to carve out what you want to do and carve out your successes. These men or women are done. Now what? So how can they transition? And one of the things about that transition is how do I maintain health? How do I make myself healthy for the real world, not my other world, right? Because as, first of all, from, a, from a, like a football player standpoint, they're always looked at differently because they're just big. You know, they're big guys. And, uh, but even, even some of the women that I've, that I've covered, at, you know, a lot who were tennis players or golfers or women's basketball players, whatever, they're in much better health now when, when, than when they were playing because they, they realize they're not doing what they did before. Their caloric intake has to change. Their approach to life has to change. And as you get older, you realize there are certain things that you can't be doing anymore or you shouldn't be doing anymore. So to touch on those people that have been successful and have gotten healthier, you know, even after playing sports, are they different people? Is Were they given additional resources? Did they understand their whys earlier on? Like, what do you think makes a difference between those who all, let's talk all about athletes, those who end up continuing, you know, to live their best life and even improve on their health and their productivity afterwards, and those who don't? I think that the ones that are, are losing that weight and are living their best life in your words. I think they, during their playing days, even though they were big and they ate a lot, they were eating the right foods. I think they, it was a foundation that was built within them. Some of them are outliers where they go, you know, I, I can't, I'm a, I'm a 280 pound guy and I've had five knee operations and my knees can't take it. So I'm smart enough to know what I need to, one of the things I really need to do is lose weight so the knees have less pressure on them, right? And, or my back, things like that. Um, I mean, that's so I think they're smart enough to know that. Some, it's funny because the ones that are to me that I notice that are the healthiest are the guys who were really big, who were who were linemen, whatever, and the ones that have like kind of gotten bigger were the ones that never had to worry about. It. Do you think that's partly because of how we train them? Like a lot of people who needed to gain weight, they are often given much more calories. And it's like the wrestlers that I see, they often have very disordered eating habits because they would literally binge right after they made weight, yeah. you know, and then they would cut and then they would gain. Do you think part of it may be our fault in how we like? I, you know, I don't know. I think that I think that that a good majority of it was that their their metabolism was such that they could eat what they wanted when they wanted and it didn't matter. Yeah. Right. And and they needed to eat a lot just to maintain if they didn't need, a, you know, meet a certain requirement of calories, they couldn't maintain because th their metabolism was moving. And then when they retired, the metabolism and they got older, their metabolism slowed down, but they were still eating the same way. And as a result, they started to get bigger and bigger and bigger and trying to change that methodology, right? And trying to get, you know, uncomfortable uh, was difficult for them because they really never had to do it. I mean, there are certain, you know, like, like when, you, when you leave sports, you know, everything was done for you. So I give a lot of credit to these guys. I have to, I have to tell you, they have athletes, especially the ones that I dealt with, had the strongest and most willful minds of any people I had ever met in my life, because they would train for a moment. Olympic athletes, you know, you would see the greats, the absolute greats, Muhammad Ali. I spent an enormous amount of time with him, enormous. And, and he would say flat out, you know, I don't win the fight in the ring. I, ring, I win the fight when I'm doing my road work and my preparation. That's where I win the fight, right? So to be able to, to Olympic swimmers, Olympic divers, Olymp, Olympians, period, they work four years, eight years, 20 years, their entire life for that one race. You know, my first interview was with Jesse Owens. And, and, and here he tells you and talks to you about, you know, running in front of Adolf Hitler. You know, he trained his whole, a, a black man in an Aryan country, 
having to run in front of Adolf Hitler, what it was like for him and the pressure and, and, and how much it meant to him. I mean, just remarkable. And the strength of their minds to be able to get rid of all the noise and concentrate, have that, that, that laser focus, to me, just always, I always admired that and had a deep, deep respect for that. I always talk about athletes living in the moment. Can they live, literally live in that moment? Is the stage too big that their mind can't handle it? You know, young, young, a, a young coach said to me, a football coach, college coach said to me one time, I make a lot of money. I make a great living. I love what I do. But people don't understand that my job security is dependent on an 18-year-old going across the middle, catching a pass in front of 80,000 people. <laughs> it's, it's incredible. So um, their minds are, you know, they, some of them may not know what the, what the capital of Washington is or capital of Florida is. You know, people will laugh or chuckle. Bullshit. Pardon me. It, it's just th their minds are so strong um, to be able to do what they do. Um, it, it's, it's just it's truly remarkable. I don't mean to be going on so long, but I oh, oh, love no, it. You're fine. <laughs> Tony, what, um, what do you want people to know that it's like to get older? What does it mean to get older? In, it, what does it mean to get older? It's like, Someone recently said to me, my God, you're going to be 72. I go, yeah. And they go, you don't look 72. I said, well, what's 72 supposed to look like? <laughs> right? What is it supposed to look like? I don't know what it's supposed to look like. I think what's important as you get older, what, the things you need to know and understand is your body's going to change. Uh, you need to accept that. And, and sometimes we have a hard time. I have a hard time sometimes watching it change. It just does. It's, it's, it's human nature. Um, you need to change your habits. You can't consume the kind of calories you once consumed. Uh, and I think you need to stay active and your mind needs to stay active. You need to have a purpose. You need to, you need to feel like you have value. And it, it, sometimes it's not in front of you. Sometimes you have to go find it. You know, when I retired at 59, I already had plan A, B, and C ready to rock and roll because I didn't <laughs> want to stop. I didn't want to stop this from working. I didn't want to stop this from moving. I wanted to stay active and current. And, and to me, that is, that is vital. And, you need, and if you're married, you need to love your wife or you need to love your husband. And you need to show a respect. And when your children leave, and it's back to the two, you know, the, the two people that started this whole family thing, you need to find that romance again. And you need and you need to embrace all that and not be afraid. And especially from a guy standpoint, you'll be out and they'll be bitching about their wives and going, they're going, Well, aren't you bitching about your wife? I go, No, I love my wife. She's wonderful. <laughs> like, you know, cut the crap, like grow up. You know, like I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna buy into being everybody else. It's just, it's okay. You know, and I'm not saying they're all like that, you know. I'm just saying that, you know, I I, I think you need to maintain your individuality, embrace your age. I love style. I talked to you about this. And, and sometimes I'll be at a, at a store and I want, want to buy a pair of jeans and they'll all go, Oh my gosh, they look great on you. Wow. You know, and I'm going, yeah, I'm 70 years old. I'm not 20. Okay. I don't need skinny tight. I, I don't need that. I, I need to be able to take my pants down if I need to and not be <laughs> peeled out of them. All right. So I need something that stylish, and current and someone from my age, I, cause I don't want to be 20 anymore. You know, I wish at 20, I had the wisdom that I have now, but I don't. And you try to impart that to your children and try to impart that to others. And, and so, Amy, I don't know if that answers your, your question, but I think that's important to embrace your age and, and, and be your, try to live that best life that you can live where you feel productive and you feel at the end of the day, like, Oh, I'm tired because I'm not tired because I haven't done anything because you get tired from not doing anything. I'm tired because I had a productive day. My mind was moving. I had a great conversations with people. I decided I wanted to do something different and people embraced it. Um, 
And I, I helped somebody, I volunteered, I found something where I could, you know, I love smiling at people. Um, so I, I think it's easy to be a curmudgeon, man. It's easy to be nasty. It's easy to be critical. It's easy to be judgmental. You know, shame on us if you are, especially as you get older. You know, I find more and more people my age who are more cranky than ever. Mm-hmm. You know? Tony, I want you to walk us through your day. Which oh, I was just gonna say, ah! real, little, real quick though, I was going to say, I think you're the epitome of um, um, how aging does not have to be a painful process. I think a lot of times we accept that as we get older, life is going to suck. And that is not true. Oh. Um, it does not have to be that way. And and I think you prove that day in and day out that I try. You know, when, you know, in particular with healthcare, uh, the natural progression is people's problem list gets longer and longer and the medication list gets longer and longer. And I tell people all the time, I spent over 10 years of training, learn how to learning how to give people diagnoses and give them medications and offer procedures and surgeries. And now I've dedicated my career to actually taking people off medication because yeah. it can happen. And there's, you know, as a provider, we're not taught that. We're not taught how to look at the medication list and see what we can take off because most patients don't necessarily get better, but it can happen. I believe, I totally believe that. And and I totally believe that you can heal yourself. And I'm not saying, listen, uh, you know, God forbid you get something serious, some some serious cancer, but I still believe your attitudes and, 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 and how you meditate toward that, um, is, is, is paramount. I mean, Amy, your question might wa- walk you through a day. I usually get up between six and six 30 in the morning. Um, you know, do the brush your teeth, wash your face, do all that. And the first thing I'll do is, is get a half a lemon, put it in some tap water, you know, good tap water and, or, or a bottle of water. And I drink a, a full 17 ounce glass of lemon water. Um, and then I'll, I'll read, I'll meditate for an hour, say my prayers, and then I'll have a quick snack of some fruit and then I'll go on a walk. And I usually walk in the morning. I'll usually walk for about an hour and 20 minutes. And I try to do like, again, at my age, I, I, I you know, I'm not going to be sprinting. So I try and do about an 18 minute, 18, 10 mile walking, um, which gets me by the end of that hour and 20, something like that. I usually get about four, four miles in or something like that. Uh, and then I'll come in and I'll have a, you know, really good breakfast. I, I love good, healthy granola. I don't like the, you know, the real sugary, sugary stuff, or I'll have yogurt. Um, or I'm trying now, I, I, I haven't, I'm trying it in the morning, uh, taking hot oatmeal and whipping an egg white in it. So it cooks uh, and doing something like that. Uh, and then uh, I'll do a, you know, a tour. I like to graze. So I do two or three hours later, I'll have a, a, a you know, whether it's, yo- if I didn't have yogurt in the morning, I have yogurt or I'll get a good protein clean bar that I keep, you know, if, if, if this Dr. Perlman, if I ask her one more time about protein bars, she's going to actually crown me. Uh, and then, you know, I'll have a good lunch. I love, I'm a, I, I don't have an addictive personality, but I love peanut butter. So um, I'll, I'll get some good peanut butter and some really good healthy bread and, and do that or have a big lunch. You get a good salad with, with, with good protein in it. And then for dinner, you know, we'll have a lot of protein and, and good fiber. And I think that's the other thing. I, I do a lot of, I do probably more than I should. And I'll admit that to the two doctors here. I do a lot of fiber. And, and I think that's important, especially at my age. You know, you got you to gotta keep it, you got to keep it moving. <laughs> so that's kind of a, a snapshot of, of, of my day. So your day is only eating and walking? <laughs> Well, so no. What are you doing between lunch and dinner and after? Oh, no, no, no. I mean, I'm active. I mean, I'm, I'm the sexual active. medicine specialist wants to know. <laughs> no, I no, I, I, I like you know, like the last couple of days, and and I do it. What's great is I'm busier now than when I work, but I'm busier on on a on a more a, a more sane schedule. Um, last, I'm doing. I was very blessed and very fortunate to be asked to to facilitate the oral history project for the University of Miami. So in 2025, the University of Miami, my my alma mater will be a hundred years old. So me and a producer, uh, brilliant young producer who does screenwriting at the University of Miami, she's a professor, and the the Dean of the Cinema 
cinema school, uh, the three of us go out and interview like the top 100 alumni uh, from the University of Miami. In the last couple of days, we just, incredible people that, you know, and these interviews that I do with these people are last minimally an hour. Um, and just remarkable. Last couple of days, I, I interviewed the first, uh, one of the first black law school, law school students at the University of Miami. He was one of seven admitted that first year. Um, just remarkable stories. So I do that and I do my, my boom, baby boomer report and I do a radio show once a week and I do um, Zoom events with doctors for the University of Miami Miller School of Health, the, the, the University of Miami Healthcare System. Uh, I did one with your sister and um, she was a star. She was a stud in that. In that well, in that's that, where I that. met you, Tony, is we were exactly. talking about nutrition and you yeah. sent me a message through the chat and you said, what's your number? We need to talk after. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I love talking nutrition. I love it. So, I mean, I, I do that. And then, you know, I have two young children who are who are very successful at what they do. And I try to stay, you know, and my wife and I try and do as many things together as we can. And uh, so I'm busy. I, I, I am, and I'm asked to do interviews like this. I, um, it, when, when the, when the Brian Flores, the coach of the Dolphins story broke uh, with, with his lawsuit against, you know, the, the, the NFL, I was asked by the black network to uh, the black entertainment network to do interviews. So I did a lot of interviews for them there. So um, I, I still get to do, and I speak around the country for three different companies. And so I'm busy. I, I'm busy. I, I like to stay busy. And, and I, you know, I, I want to, uh, the great Satchel Page, look them up when, when we, you get off here. Satchel Page was in the Negro Leagues, baseball player, and pitched, and he was a pitcher, pitched until he was in, into his 50s. And just great stories. And I was with Satchel one day. And I said, is there anything you, you haven't done that you want to do? And he goes, yes. He says, I want to be able to go into my bedroom at night, flip off the, the light switch and get in bed before the light goes out. <laughs> and I, I re that resonates to my mind today. So it's sort of like you want to stay one step ahead of Father Time if you, possi if you possibly can. Just one step, you know, so that you enjoy your life. Um, whatever you want to do, you do, and you do it, you do it in a way that your age will allow you to do. Right. Uh, so I think that's what's, you have to be mindful. Hey, listen, I am not perfect. I blow it all the time. I'll, I'll do things that I'm like, I go, can you be that much of a knucklehead? You know, I'll say <laughs> to myself, like, how stupid, Jamie, how old are you? Don't you like, have you not learned yet? You know, but I will say this every once in a while, you want frosted flakes. I'm sorry. You just do. And, 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 and so if you want them, you get them. You just, you just don't make it a habit. Okay, hey guys, thank you for having me. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. That's all, folks. I'm Amy Perlman. And I'm Michelle Perlman. Thank you for tuning in. We'll see you next time.